Our first session today is on the theme of hope and humanity. And those are the two big pressing issues for us in dealing with the pandemic. The chair of our session is Professor Christine Keneally, who is the global authority on Angkor de Boer on the Great Hunger. And she's based in the wonderful Quinnipiac University in Connecticut. And that also, of course, is the location of the Museum of Ireland's Great Hunger, of which we're all very proud. Uh, Christine Keneally is a beacon of justice, of compassion, but also of education and understanding the lessons of the great hunger itself, a dreadful pandemic of its time. I want you to welcome, please, to really get the campfire going now that it has been lit by the president and the mayor. I give you Professor Christine Keneally. Okay. Welcome everybody. Machina Mula, President Higgins, Congressman Neil, thank you all for your inspiring opening words. Machine, thank you for your vision in bringing us together today for this very important event. I'm Christine Keneally, Director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University. I'm delighted to be chairing the opening session of this event and to introduce you to our panel of three very special guests. So please welcome Kevin Davis, Paul Haller, and Lee Ann Howe. You are all very welcome. And some very brief biographies. Fuller versions are available online. Our first panelist is Kevin Davis. Kevin, you're very welcome, Kevin. Kevin has worked in healthcare administration and hospital operations for over 25 years. A proud son of Philadelphia, Kevin also serves on many boards and was a former member of the Irish American Business Chamber and Network in Philadelphia. Our second guest is Rushin Paul Haller. Paul, you're very welcome. Born in Belfast, Paul left home in 1971 on a journey that not only took him to some of the remoter parts of the world, but also became a spiritual pilgrimage. In Japan, Paul was introduced to Zen practice. He later became ordained a Buddhist monk. Paul is founder and former abbot of Outreach at San Francisco Zen Center. Our third panelist is Leanne Howe, who is the Eidson Distinguished Professor at the University of Georgia. Leanne, who hails from the Choctaw Nation, is a prolific writer and lecturer. Her interests including native and indigenous histories and literatures, performance studies, film, and indigeneity. The theme of our discussion this morning is hope and humanity. What can Irish America bring to our understanding of the COVID pandemic? As Irish people, as African Americans, as Native Americans, we each share histories that have been filled with dislocation, discrimination, racism, poverty, and starvation. As a historian of Ireland's great hunger, I have written extensively about disease and death during those dark, tragic years in the 1840s. And as is the case today, during a famine, a hurricane, or a pandemic, it is always groups who are already poor, oppressed, and marginalized who suffer the most. But, and this is the message of our panel, in the midst of unimaginable horror, we always find resilience, kindness, hope, and humanity. So I'm going to start by asking each of our panelists to give an example of humanity in the midst of this current pandemic. Kevin, may I start with you? Kevin, your work means that you have direct experience with working with first-hand responders and frontline workers. Can sure. you share some examples of humanity that have occurred during this pandemic? Okay, um, well again, first of all, I'd like to thank and extend my appreciation to Martin and his staff and certainly many others for the invitation and pulling this incredible event together. So with regards from a healthcare perspective, uh, this pandemic certainly has tested the will of, I think, humanity, not only in the United States, but certainly around the world. Um, I think not only from national lockdowns, social distancing mandates, but social distancing even from loved ones when they're in the hospital during final moments of their life. You know, in spite of the pandemic, um, I think a couple things are happening from a humanity standpoint. I think you're noticing healthcare workers uh, are rising to the occasion 
uh, healthcare workers, first responders. They're stepping up. They're doing whatever's necessary and possible to provide care for the sick at whatever cost and even uh, without having necessary tools and equipment. You know, they're doing whatever it takes to, to address and provide compassionate care uh, to, to patients who are our families, our friends, our neighbors. On the other hand, I think what you're seeing is during this situation, you are seeing all types of people come together, black, white, Native Americans, Asian, Latino, men, women, older, younger, you name it, and they're all coming together. Uh, they're out there collectively standing side by side, protesting for a common cause. And that's a, a cause that's focused on uh, equal and a just society for all, despite the pandemic. So again, you, you, it, it brings the, good, the goodness out of people. And so what that tells me is that when you see so much negative happening locally and even around the world, a lot of people still have, I think, a moral compass for doing the right thing, even putting themselves at risk. And whether it's their faith, for me, you know, whether it's their faith in a higher calling, their moral fabric, I think genuinely people care about one another. I think they care about their families, they care about their friends, they care about their neighbors. I also believe that they know what they're fighting for will make a difference, a better society, a better place to live. And that fight isn't just for one, I think they know that what they're fighting for, it's an improvement and a better world for all. And when you think about it and you wanna wrap this all up in one word, I think they're, they're fighting, they're fighting for humanity. Okay, thank you, Kevin. That's, that's a great opening statement. And I think on behalf of everybody, we'd like to say thank you to frontline workers everywhere, not just in America, throughout the world. They're doing a great job. Um, if I could now turn to Paul. Paul, compassion seems to be at the heart of many principles of Zen. How do we connect with our humanity during a time of economic uncertainty, political chaos, and COVID-19? Well, to echo what Kevin was saying, that are, are the, the immensity of the suffering that's involved in all of this, you know, it can either cause us to contract and, and to blame, accuse, or it can uh, call us to share, to open up and, and to see that there's a common ground to our suffering. And, and this is the basic teaching of Buddhism, and in particular Zen. And, and we certainly have experienced this, you know, our own center has been impacted by the virus and, and, and our supporters are, are the members of our society are, have, have drawn, come forth and, and been a great uh, support at this time. And then through that, it's, it's allowed us to reach out and support other people of faith and that's one feature of what this epidemic has done. It has drawn the different faith traditions together. And uh, Buddhism does emphasize uh, compassion, but also a, an insight and, and a, a patience. You know, it, this is the nature of our life. I, I think of growing up in, in, in Belfast, in the inner city, and being confronted with the um, discrimination and, and the poverty there, and, and how that um, drew us together there as a society, as a com in a humane and a shared way. Um, and, and I have seen in myself, as I moved towards the United States, uh, how in some ways that was missing, you know? In, in some ways I think this crisis ha has, is like a wake up call, that we need each other. You know, when I was growing up in Ireland in that poverty, it was evident that we needed each other, that, that our shared survival uh, was dependent upon each other. And uh, now I'm seeing in communities of faith in our own in, and others, that this shared survival it has awakened our shared humanity. 
And, and to me, it's, it's, it's not just a coincidence that other issues of our society have, like Black Lives Matter, has risen to the surface and is, I think, being embraced in a way that it never has before. And, and uh, so I, in the midst of all of this, I see reasons for hope, you know, that, that we are indeed uh, waking up to the common ground of who we are and how we are. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. So compassion and community can really help us. Thank you. So our third panelist, Leanne. Leanne, as we know, maybe not everybody knows, but in 1847, the Choctaw Nation sent a number of donations to, quote, their starving brethren in Ireland, unquote. This act of selfless kindness has never been forgotten in Ireland. Can you talk about this donation and the Choctaw concept of giving, please? I'm very honored to be here today with all of you and talk about hope in the time of COVID. Um, I, I would like to open with a quick, a very quick song about um, our survival. And it then really is part of the larger conversation on what we are doing for each other. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna open this way. Isa halali ha toko iksa ilya isha shki. Isa halali ha toko iksa ilya isha shki. Because you are holding on to me, I am not dead yet. I am not dead yet. And so that's a song that we sang and um, for generations. Um, and now it, it always helps me um, know that we are going to be okay, we're going to survive, we're going to help each other. Um, the song is also about, uh, I think one of the reasons, I am not dead yet, and when we heard in March 1847 that the Irish people were starving, that our people um, immediately took up a collection and sent the money is, is has been disputed. But let's say uh, uh, about $170 uh, in donations that we took up. And um, uh, that was March 1847. And the news came to us from the Arkansas contingency. So uh, in the EMA, the, the way we are giving and continue to give, I think is very important. The first thing that the Choctaw Nation did in July of this year, 2020, uh, was they started a COVID relief fund. And that money that we, uh, our tribe uh, has put forth is to go to tribal members who are uh, suffering terribly and mightily from COVID-19. And so we uh, are keeping our, our, uh, our commitment to each other, our commitment to hope by offering relief, offering food, and offering to each other the, uh, the brotherhood, the sisterhood that we have always called upon and that has sustained us over thousands of years. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. And the, the, in Ireland, the memory of the gift has been commemorating, commemorated with some memorials. There's now a scholarship for Choctaw students to come to Ireland. So that circle of giving has really been very, very beautiful. So thank you. So we don't have much time now, but could I go to our panelists again? And I know some of you have touched on it, uh, maybe hope, what gets us through. But uh, Leanne used the word, what sustains us? Perhaps you could say what hope you have for the future and what will sustain you to get us through what is a very uncertain future. So again, if I could start with Kevin, please. 
Sure, sure. You know, I, I do. I do have a lot of hope. I do have a lot of hope for a better tomorrow. Um, it's as if society has these blips that test our resolve, our commitment to humanity. And I think it comes down to education. I think it comes down to exposure. I think each generation becomes more understanding, more accepting. And I think they're appreciating social differences more so as gifts to society rather than threats. Um, when you look at events such as 9-11, wildfires in California, hurricanes, destruction along the East Coast, people, they step up. They, and they, they know, they do it intuitively. They step up to the plate in response to take care of uh, their neighbors. So that tells me something. You know, I believe there's more good in our society than there is bad. I honestly believe that most in our society are compassionate, <clears throat> excuse me, loving, caring, empathetic people. Um, I think there will always be some who need a little bit more time for getting on board before the train leaves the station. Uh, and I think there will always be a few who will choose to stay where they are, but for whatever reason, uh, we in society will never turn their backs on those individuals. So that, that gives me hope. It gives me hope that we are a compassionate, empathetic society and a forgiving society. From a healthcare professional's perspective, I see humanity bring to the table every day at work. <clears throat> when I watch clinicians respond to patients that come into the hospital, they will do whatever it takes, whatever is necessary to save a life and to demonstrate a commitment for improving a person's well-being. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I wouldn't say that um, I'm a very religious person. I do have strong faith. But, you know, but I do believe in Scripture, especially when it says that we are all made in the likeness and image of Christ. And for me, that gets reinforced for me every day through my work because if we were so different, then we wouldn't be able to do what we do in healthcare by using someone else's organs or blood to save a life. If we were that different, then the miracles that happen in healthcare wouldn't be possible. Mm -hmm. We have more in common than differences, and I think uh, we're making progress. Though slow, uh, I do have confidence that we'll get there. So, you know, my final remarks will be that I believe that there's a lot of good in humanity. And whenever it rises, we'll keep becoming better for it. Thank you for that very uplifting message. Thank you, Kevin. And Paul, can you talk about your hope for the future? Um, I'm also hopeful. I, I, I do think that the crisis in our individual lives and in our collective lives, they, they, they challenge us to look at what's happening. They, they challenge us not to just be absorbed in the everyday busyness that's so um, seductive. They, they draw us back into a place of looking what's really important about our life. You know, what, what, what is the foundation to all of the activities that we're involved in? You know? and, and, and certainly in, in the Buddhist tradition, that's that's also the common ground. You know, I think of Rilke saying, you know, God is the gravity that draws us down into our being, you know, our individual being and our collective being. And I think this this virus and and just witnessing how it you know it's not a particular sector of our society. It's not even a particular to a a nationality, it's, it's global. And, and I think that, uh, that sense of global being, which is also arising out of our challenges with the ecology of our planet, um, I, I'm hopeful that, that we will indeed become global citizens. And, and that from that common ground, our differences, they can become an enrichment, you know? The, the, yes, there are many ways of looking at our life. There are many ways in, in which our cultural backgrounds express 
what's important. So from that shared humanity that's, that's now global, I, I think a wisdom can arise that, that comes along with that compassion. And, and that from that place, um, we can do marvelous things. You know, we, we, we can shelter in each other, that old Irish saying, that, that, and, and also we can support each other. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that, that we, will, we will mature as a human race, that we will mature in, in terms of keeping in the foreground of our lives what's truly important in our life. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And I love the concept of shelter in each other. It's beautiful. Thank you. So, Leanne, do you have anything you'd like to say? Any hope for the future? <laughs> Well, yes, um, I, I'd like to end with a couple of uh, sentiments. Um, I just got a, a, a call a couple of days ago from a friend of mine in my hometown who is uh, from Ada, Oklahoma. And she had just been, um, uh, she had just been awarded a Fulbright. She's um, not Choctaw, but she's Creek, Muscogee Creek. And she's going to be going to Ireland this um uh, year later this year I think she she leaves in September but she will be going to Cork University and uh, working with uh, Lee Jenkins and on stories and storytelling I am so excited for her uh, to be doing this in the midst of a pandemic our people are uh, reaching out to offer themselves and also to learn from other communities and so in that way I would leave you with this uh, notion our homelands sing a heart song of sorrow right now but we are singing we are singing we are singing and the mother is singing still Thank you. Okay, so thank you. There's a lot of messages we can take from what our three panelists have said and said so eloquently and beautifully. So our time is up. I want to thank our three panelists, um, Kevin Davis, Paul Haller, thank and you. Leanne Howe. You've been fantastic. This is a great way to start the campfire. And now I'd like to hand over to Martine. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.